Well hello there, pen pals and pseudo fans. If you're like me, you've had this technology-driven life and its many tools and programs forcefully thrust upon you at the behest of society to feed its obsession with advancement. And while many of us have learned to adapt and get by, most of us are hard-pressed to explain the inner workings of the controlled system we call the internet. PC load letter? What the fuck does that mean? Unless you've had a Silicon Valley job or worked in a programming or computing field, it's highly probable that you're severely undereducated about the entire thing and not even aware of how ignorant you are. Don't feel bad, I was too, and we're far from alone. We all know that, the forces that be, pulling the strings in this realm have control over the World Wide Web and the information it provides us. When we type something into our online search engine browsers, the flood of information we receive after hitting enter is often nothing more than a pile of not milk nonsense. The search engine results pages, commonly known as the SERPs, are riddled with mainstream narratives, politicized propaganda, and other bunk, misleading information. But how is this possible? That is, how does the Ministry of Information, otherwise known as Google, maintain its ranking stronghold over the SERPs? If you said, the algorithm, well, you're not wrong. Yet, it goes deeper than that. It goes much deeper than I'm even aware, as I haven't been inside the actual, belly of the beast. For the better part of the past few years, however, I have worked alongside and on the back of said beast. I've seen firsthand how this business, yes, the internet is run as a business, operates. What I learned from my experience may not surprise you, but it should make the bigger picture from 10,000 feet back much clearer. The internet largely functions as a data collection conglomerate, websites are its individual businesses working to categorize you, label you, define you. Given the transhumanism agenda narrative, it's as if we're programming our future selves, the meta-virtual versions of ourselves. Each recorded transaction, thought, memory, expression, feeling, idea, or question we ever share online is entered into the synapses of AI, building and shaping a digital copy of us. Essentially, we are feeding the machines to learn from our likeness, and from what we can see emerging in the AI arena, it's clear, now, that's exactly what's happening. Of all the ironic struggles I've created for myself. About a decade ago, I decided I wanted to create a thriving, successful website, yet I had no idea how to do that. Other than various point-of-sale operations at my retail and customer service jobs, I hadn't actually learned how to operate a computer much beyond its typewriter capabilities, and after I failed to teach myself JavaScript and HTML at the turn of the millennium, I actively avoided learning anything about how computers function, let alone the internet. Still, I was motivated enough to follow through, and I created my website, pennamepublications.com. But again, I knew nothing about what to do, beyond giving my personal data and hard-earned money to various internet businesses, to establish a space of my own on the World Wide Web. Nothing. And the AI programs weren't available to do everything for you back then. Fast forward to today, and I have three years of experience in creating and optimizing SEO content. And, until the AI takeover so drastically affected the SEO sphere and I was let go I even spent a brief time on staff writing for a successful, lucrative business, aka, a website, that teaches others how to create successful, lucrative websites, aka businesses. Can you smell the irony yet? To be honest, I've been happy not to write for them anymore, because I really don't get any joy out of it. I have no interest in the topic. It's technical, not in a good way, complex, not in a fun way, and overall jibber-jabber as far as I'm concerned. Only after I started to learn the language of this foreign land in which I found myself did I start to recognize why I struggled to take this on over a decade ago. Turns out, I had no clue about who or what I was up against. My battle plans were all bunk because I failed to know my true enemy. And thus, we uncover the origin of this pseudo-perspective presentation, created for anyone who, like me, was distrusting of the internet from the get-go, yet unable to put their finger on the reason why. For many, the term algorithm is associated with the man believed by some to be the inventor of the internet, one Mr. Al Gore. That's because on March 9, 1999, Mr. Gore told an attack wolf. During my service in the United States Congress, I took the initiative in creating the internet. I took the initiative in moving forward a whole range of initiatives that have proven to be important to our country's economic growth and environmental protection, improvements in our educational system. <laughs> hey! Is this overly prideful sharing of merely having and expressing an idea for something poorly phrased? Perhaps. Bad on purpose? Absolutely. Personally, I think this scripted scene in the world play served to allow for the manifesting of the phrase slash joke, the Al Gore rhythm. Any additional confusion and ignorance in the understanding of algorithms achieved is simply a bonus. 
Of course, the mysterious forces in this world also allowed for other factors working alongside this incident to help ensure that. For instance, the curriculum used by my teachers, and countless others, no doubt, employed terms such as formula, equation, or a series of steps, in lieu of algorithm, when teaching me and other millennials certain concepts, you know, so as to be less confusing and understood by a wider range of students. Gotta love the progressive education system. From there, all you need to do is replace Common Core with STEM, inventing a new math in the process, and you're really only a generation or so away from a complete reprogramming of the people and their collective knowledge. Throw in a global pandemic for good measure, why don't you, nothing like a new normal download to help get a few glitches out. Still, the algorithm isn't designed to, divide and conquer, as I've heard it described. At least, not to our available knowledge. It is, however, designed to learn every intimate detail about you so that knowledge can be used to control you, specifically, to keep you consuming. Lest you forget, in this system, we are but consumers under capitalistic control, consuming products advertised as food, water, air, clothing, shelter, utilities, medicine, home goods, entertainment, education, news, assistance. Each and every bit is a mere product being sold to you for your consumption. If anything, when it comes to procuring information and at seeking truth, the algorithm is designed to support confirmation bias, a conclusion you'll likely confirm by surmising the same after considering the following. Here's a list of the basic acronyms and terms used by those who build and operate successful websites that I'll be highlighting throughout this video. If you aren't already familiar with them in this context, you'll be sufficiently versed after watching. Hey Pseudo. Define successful website. Sure thing, that can be quite subjective in assessment. When I think of my website as being successful, I'm thinking of the people who might find it, read my work, and benefit from that. I've only truly been focused on wanting to teach, inspire, and help others grow themselves, perhaps even provide reassurance that no one is ever truly alone, nor should they be. I want to make an effort to offer wisdom to others that I have gained, as others have done for me in the past. And if even one person was enlightened to the point of enacting a positive change in themselves and their life, then I would consider my website successful. And as far as my SEO employer, moreover, Google, was concerned, successful a means authoritative and financially lucrative. Don't get me wrong, I'm not trying to diss on anyone here. I'm simply pointing out the fact that the main priority of website owners, above and beyond anything else, is to run a financially lucrative, i.e. authoritative, a website. Nothing more, nothing less. And the main priority of search engines are to list the most authoritative, i.e. financially lucrative, these sites. Nothing more, nothing less. Now, we know what it means to be financially lucrative. It makes money, or, turns a profit, if you will. But what exactly does Google mean when they say authoritative? Well, that's the crux of where our discernment lies. And yes, I am crafting upon wordplay. Indeed, it may do you well to heed what you hear, and see. An authoritative website operates as a serious business. Website owners' commitment to these websites extends beyond casual engagement, they're genuinely dedicated to building robust teams, expanding their client bases, and establishing bona fide business entities. While authority sites are classified as businesses, they differ distinctly from conventional enterprises that use a direct product-centric approach, like Apple, for example. Authority sites are generally considered niche sites, spanning topics such as gardening, pets, sports, snowboarding, electronics, anything you can think of, actually, and I do mean, anything. Markedly, it is the niche or thematic focus that gets these sites to stand out. Regardless of niche, these authoritative websites prioritize offering extensive, free content. This free content serves as a pathway, gradually guiding visitors toward purchases or promotions. The monetization strategies of authority sites typically involve ads, affiliate marketing, and the sale of either physical or digital products. As opposed to businesses centered around products, early encounters with authority sites often involve accessing free content, joining an email list, or following an affiliate link that eventually leads to a purchase. The purpose of the content on these authority sites, generally speaking, will fall into the following categories. To make money from ads, to promote a specific affiliate product, to acquire links. The information provided on every page or article follows the inverted pyramid of value. This means the answer or conclusion is presented first, followed by supporting detail and analysis, and finally, background and considerations are offered. This is to provide the value up top and the supporting evidence further down. Notably, authority website owners also need to consider things like attention span. Specifically, they follow the seven-second test. In the first seven seconds a typical user visits a website, they will make a snap decision on a number of factors, including what the site is about, 
whether they can trust the site, if the site is interesting to them, and what they are supposed to do with the page. The final consideration is readers versus scanners. The majority of people who visit authority sites are more than likely only going to scan through articles and pick out the important points. And website owners do everything they can to aid that through the clever use of H2, H3, and H4 headers, correct formatting, and easily digestible sentences. How easily digestible? Well, around the 5th to 7th grade reading levels, creating content that's a breeze for anyone to take in. Before proceeding, I should clarify that me, or anyone, saying, the algorithm, is somewhat catty and wholly hyperbolic. That's because there is no one, singular, the, algorithm. In contrast, a plethora of algorithms exists behind the scenes, assisting in controlling our lives. So, what is an algorithm? An algorithm is essentially a step-by-step -step procedure or set of instructions designed to solve a specific problem or perform a particular task. It's much like, say, a recipe or an IKEA manual that tells you exactly what to do to achieve a desired outcome. Algorithms exist in many forms and are used in various fields like mathematics and computer science. In fact, while you may not have realized, algorithms are already prominent in your everyday life. You even have, no doubt, employed algorithmic thinking at some point in your life by sorting something by date or alphabetically, for instance. When it comes to computer science, AI, and all things internet, algorithms are crucial because they form the basis for writing programs. They define how data is processed, manipulated, and transformed. Examples include sorting algorithms, like bubble sort or quick sort, searching algorithms, like binary search, or algorithms used in artificial intelligence, like machine learning algorithms. They're all essentially sets of instructions designed to perform specific tasks efficiently and accurately. In a sense, one could compare algorithms to atoms, in that they are the building blocks that power many modern-day technologies, from the apps on our smartphones to the complex systems running behind the scenes on the internet. Remember how I said before that there is no, one, singular, the, algorithm? Well, while that's not untrue, there is a set of algorithms known as, the algorithm. And that's the Google algorithm. So, what is the Google algorithm? To answer this, I'd like to share a direct quote from my former employer's training course. Google uses a complex set of calculations to rank authority. This is also known as the algorithm. The algorithm takes into account thousands of factors. Some of which are known, others are still a mystery. So again, I ask, what is the Google algorithm? The answer is, we don't know. The specific mathematical formula Google uses for its algorithm is not publicly disclosed. Google uses descriptors such as sophisticated and complex when talking about its algorithm and we're told it involves numerous factors, signals, and machine learning processes to determine the rankings of web pages in its search results. Google assures us that the algorithm is designed to deliver the most relevant and useful results to users based on their search queries. The claim is that it involves weighing and processing various factors, such as content relevance, quality, authority, user experience, and more to determine the most appropriate rankings for a given search. Occasionally, Google provides general guidance or information about specific factors that influence rankings, but the exact formula or equation itself is proprietary and constantly evolving. Supposedly, this helps prevent manipulation and ensures that search results remain reliable and useful to users. Website owners and other professionals study observed patterns, industry best practices, and Google's guidelines to optimize their websites and content to align with known factors that positively impact search rankings, rather than having access to a specific equation or formula for Google's algorithm. In other words, website owners are made to run the hamster wheel, ever chasing top ranking in the SERPs. Rankings that are always changing, never completely and permanently retained, except the artificial, forced options. The World Wide Web is crawling with strange creatures. Let's begin with what we expect to find in webs, spiders. You can think of, the algorithm, as King Daddy Long Legs of the Internet, crawling around in search of something to consume. Except the Spider King has a very picky and particular appetite, and his web spans all of Earth. The only other difference between this analogical spider and those living in the forsaken corners of your humble abode is that you control what and when the spider collects as its next meal. Every time you enter something into a search engine, you feed the spider. Every time you visit a website, you help weave a more direct path toward that site for the spider come its next mealtime. Yet, there is a special trick that website owners use to give their site a better chance at being the next meal you choose for it. That special trick is called SEO. SEO stands for Search Engine Optimization. 
Basically, this is a method used by website owners to optimize content as a means of getting Google and other search engines, such as Bing or YouTube, to display their websites in search engine results pages, aka, the SERPs. But how exactly? Again, I'd like to quote my former employers directly for this answer. Essentially, SEO is the process of optimizing your content so that Google wants to rank it. How do we do this? Well, here's the thing. Google doesn't outright tell us. It only gives us several cues and hints. The rest is a game of educated guesses. Now, could I, pen name pseudo protection, in all my linguistic prowess, easily have restated the explanation in my own words for you? But of course, mon ami. Yet, how could I deprive you of a chance to see the download at work? Such a fine example of the bizarre, seemingly nonchalant way that those who play the Not Milks games accept such blatant disregard for, in this case, transparency, and then take it as a game like challenge, to make money. But it is what it is on that front, I suppose. Some of the standout factors of SEO include both on page and off page factors. The biggest on page factor website owners consider is keywords. This also includes what is known as secondary and long tail keywords. Keywords are the words and phrases that people are searching for online. Website owners, or rather, the writers they hire, integrate these keywords into the articles they create, including the title. This is primarily how the algorithm recognizes a particular piece of content as relevant to any given search. Speaking of content relevancy, the content provided overall on any particular website is also considered in a single search when finding voices of authority. For instance, if a niche website is about gardening, but it also has a random article discussing motorcycles, the algorithm considers this suspicious and will take off points from the total score when ranking authority on the topic of gardening. Google, being the sentient being that it is, also has access to countless sets of user metrics. Yes, thank you, former employers. Indeed, this was no doubt intended as a tongue-in-cheek joke, yet they still said it. And I will say no more about that. User metrics consider factors such as bounce rate, which refers to the length of time users spend on a page. If an article has an unfavorable bounce rate, indicating that people who open the page then click off or close the page shortly after, this will also take points off the website's score. Finally, the Google algorithm considers the on-page factors of load speed and user experience to determine authority. If a website takes too long to load or has a buggy, unfriendly user experience, the site is likely to be omitted from the SERPs. Alongside all this, Google also considers off-page factors. Off-page factors are even more of a closely guarded secret, as they're the secret sauce that has helped Google to become the dominant search engine. Yes, and we all simply go along with it, allowing for this monopolistic-like control, don't we? What Google provides the public with, instead, is a system called PageRank. PageRank was pioneered by two Stanford students back in the late 90s. This groundbreaking approach assessed page importance based on links. This idea evolved into Google, which was still a small player in the search engine arena. Not for nothing, Google was initially named BackRub. So, you know, take that for how you will. Ultimately, Google utilized the PageRank algorithm to prioritize pages in its search results. Markedly, the action of linking other websites to any given page on a niche site is a major factor in determining their authority on a topic. But said links can't be for any old website, rather, Google prefers when the links are for trusted resources. For example, if a huge government website links to a particular page, this is a significant indicator that the page is also trustworthy. This goes the other way too. So, when websites link to mainstream sites, those mainstream sites are also gaining more authority. This might be government sites, news sites, or even popular social media sites, to name a few examples, the CDC, the World Economic Forum, the New York Times, The Guardian, even Twitter. Excuse me, X. Obviously, only the super trustworthy sources. If this sounds similar to the practice of peer review for science, that's because it's exactly the same. What's worse is that even when the link is from a quote-unquote truther site or any website attempting to debunk or otherwise expose the fraud and misinformation of said authority, it still strengthens the credibility of the mainstream site. The algorithm doesn't account for fingers pointing out blame. It counts all pointing fingers, regardless of reason, as something confirming mainstream authority. Over the years, the world of SEO has seen countless changes that redefine the perimeters of what Google considers an authoritative website. For instance, in December 2022, Google changed EAT, which stands for Expertise, Authoritativeness, and Trustworthiness, to EEAT, the extra E standing for Experience. To be clear, EEAT is not a confirmed direct factor in Google's ranking formula. Notwithstanding, a website's EEAT helps it align with Google's definition of a good search result. 
And while this concept sounds great on the surface, it's not exactly something that we can count on to be reflective of what, or more appropriately, who, is represented as the experienced expert in whom we can trust as the authority on any given topic. Markedly, this one hits personally, as I was hired as a freelance writer to act as the authoritative voice for numerous topics, several of which I had absolutely no business talking about, as I often didn't have any expertise to share, and sometimes, was completely devoid of any experience on the subject matter. Which brings me to our next point of discussion. Keep in mind, it's the internet of distractions, things, if you will. And when it comes to creating content, much of the content you find on authoritative websites is based off of content that already exists somewhere else on the internet. For this reason, I don't think it's too crass for me to surmise that authoritative content is written for dummy NPC downloads, by dummy NPC downloads. Them, and shills, of course. Basically, writing for authoritative niche websites is how people unawares become minions of the system. You see, even if a website owner has a passion for the niche topic, it's highly likely that this person is not a truther or someone who distrusts the mainstream information being presented. Moreover, alternate perspectives aren't often welcome when the focus is on money, control, and authority. So, what this means, is that website owners who aren't zealous about getting to the bottom of anything, and are unquestionably accepting of the mainstream narrative will hire experts, aka, freelance writers, to pass around the best quality du jour, information that the mainstream has to offer. And even the writers with the best intentions to provide quote-unquote truth may not be fishing out all possible sources. In fact, the odds are favorable to the information being solely sourced from other authoritative and mainstream, but I repeat myself, sources. Or, as in my case, the writer may attempt to put all angles of a topic into a post, but the idiot brainwashed website owner client requests a revision, saying, keep your opinion out of this and only give me the propaganda. I paraphrased the last part for him to convey what he meant, as he clearly had no real opinion of his own for his actual words to carry any water. While it's not something I'm proud to have on my resume, I've spent a good deal of time in my freelance writing career learning the ins and outs of the OpenAI large language model algorithm known as ChatGPT. And in that time, I've learned enough to occasionally avoid receiving biased or misleading information that's been programmed into the model as a standard response to my inquiries. Using the pseudo-proprietary pen name algorithm known as Truth Serum, I got ChadGPT to describe, in complete honesty, what the algorithm and the SEO game actually is. Caught in the web of SEO SEO is a labyrinth where your content navigates, hoping to escape the intricate web spun by Google and its search engine companions. It's a game where you try to outsmart a digital arachnid. But what lurks beneath the surface? The web unraveled. SEO, a cryptic ritual, begins by deciphering Google's motive to trap and display the most tantalizing answer to any user query, regardless of your digital predicament. Imagine your quest leading you through a tangled web of algorithmic choices, each strand deciding your content's fate. Arachnid Algorithms Google's algorithm, a spider lurking in the shadows, crafts its own narrative through a complex dance of factors. On-page enigma, from the spider's perspective, keywords are the silk threads, the more intricate the pattern, the better. But beware, irrelevant content is a potential prey, triggering the algorithmic spider's hunger. The web widens off-page. Off-page, a secret garden guarded by the spider's watchful eyes, introduces PageRank, a silk thread connecting the web's strength to linked pages. Link juice, a metaphorical venom, flows where the spider finds trust. The more links, the stickier the web, ensnaring pages in a network of perceived authority. The intricacies of linking. Link building, an intricate dance with the spider's fangs, links are the sticky strands that either strengthen your position or lead to a perilous entanglement. Markedly, keywords are the primary tool website owners use to get their websites to rank in the SERPs, and the only tool users have for blindly seeking out information on the internet. Unfortunately for truth seekers, most top keywords have been flagged and or hijacked by the Ministry of Information. Content that is optimized with certain keywords flags the algorithm, which then pulls content into the list of search results. Indeed, adding specific terms to the title of your website article or YouTube video, or mentioning them within the content, are surefire ways to gain an audience for your content, that is, if, the viewer is searching these terms. However, that also means Google or YouTube or whoever can easily corral all that content and smack those damn flags and disclaimer boxes on the content, or worse, shadow ban or restrict the content from reaching any audience at all. That's why Matt from the Quantum of Conscience YouTube channel says stuff like this. It's the flat, pause, pause, birth. But. I'm talking about pushing out babies horizontally. 
This actively prevents any Al Gore from determining what you are truly conveying. Furthermore, this is how truth or topics and terms get hijacked. Once they catch on to what people are discussing, they will start creating content with shills and mainstreamers, wave their magic SEO wand to become fully optimized, and outrank everything else in every search result for those keywords. This allows the creeps and minions to control the narrative, and causes the money and attention to funnel to those sites and channels. And while that may not be the ultimate, motivating factor at the highest levels of creepery, it certainly propels the illusion of what makes this world go round, as it were. Bottom line. Those trying to expose the nonsense need to fully immerse themselves into the SEO game, including getting advertisers on their side in order to accomplish what the mainstreamers are accomplishing. And that's caveat at both ends with, at the very least, and, while hoping for the best. To conquer the algorithm, we must manifest the keywords used to control it. However, once we manifest new keywords, they are now Agent Smiths, little gifts to the matrix system that can now be hijacked at any time. And all keywords leading to truths are eventually hijacked. So, you want to seek or share truth online? Now you have to ask yourself one question. Do I feel lucky? Well, do ya, punks? Here are six pseudo tips for successful SEO SERP sleuthing. Want to know my biggest piece of advice when it comes to playing the SEO Serpents game? Strange game. The only winning move is not to play. Indeed, the only winning move is not to play. So, don't, don't play. play. We cannot beat this game. There is only playing it. There is no winning. Only the agony of never-ending battles. The internet, like any technology, can only be used as a tool. Unfortunately, in many cases, it's not worth the time it takes to use it. Not for some purposes, anyway. We can use it for communication, but we also know even that task can be difficult and troublesome at times. Worse, we know it isn't private. 
Our conversations are being watched, logged, judged. Ultimately, we need to go back to other methods. We need to go back to physical connections. Of course, we are headed to a place where the only privacy we have is inside our own heads. Yet, they're already setting the stage to take that from us. So, I guess it was nice knowing you, Winston Smith. You've got to ask yourself one question. Do I feel lucky? Well, do you, punk? <laughs>